My most beautiful, beautiful of people today, we are going to examine the rise of a young Austrian corporal. We will look at his early years, his entry into politics, his rise to power, and finally, the birth of Nazi Germany. Let us begin. We have a lot to cover. Now, in our last lesson, we saw the end of the First World War, the most bloody in modern history. Millions of young men killed long before their time. All of the promises that people made to themselves, that society was completely sure of, at the turn of the century, dreams of new technologies, a fraternity of man, die in fields in Belgium, France, the Eastern Front. Europe, as we examined in our last lesson, is completely traumatized. We see the death of three ancient houses, uh, the house uh, that ruled over Prussia, Russia, and Austria, gone. Gone. This is a new a new era, the the death of the old ancien regime is continuing. It takes a while. These things take centuries to die. What began with the French Revolution uh, continues with the First World War. We saw the death of the Second Reich, the German Empire, the German nation as we knew it under the Kaiser, and the birth of the Weimar Republic, a democracy, a democracy. We also witnessed Germany forced to go into the Palace of Versailles, literally the place where Germany was made in 1871 and signed what many believe is an entirely unfair treaty. It loses 13% uh, of uh, Germany proper. It loses its empire. It loses most of its army. It's forced to pay back giant reparations. Germany is left very very bitter, uh, including this young man, including this man, young man, and and I'm sure you've got it already. I I I I I would think you would. If not, that's okay. We are discussing today, of course, Adolf Hitler. Perhaps in modern history, the most mythologized uh, individual uh, in history. We know so much about this man, yet there is so much bad history. Um. And outright lies in order to uh, sell books, uh, documentaries, etc. There is a tremendous amount of, 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 of misinformation out there. I'm going to attempt very briefly, please keep this in mind. I'm going to leave a lot of stuff out, I know, to try to make this person more human. Because he was. Um, he was, in fact, human. Um, history books will tell you that he was an absolute monster. History books will tell you that he was a political genius. And like all things, it's both. Certainly, certainly, certainly. The history is not black and white. It is a series of grays. Please, please, when you're a student of history, please understand that. Uh, there are literally, literally 130,000 books written on this man um, in multiple languages. If you type in Hitler in any sort of a search engine for, for, for books, documentaries, you get thousands thousands of of hits this is google books i got 12 and a half million results that includes articles uh but that gives you an idea of how much has been written on this individual hundreds of of, of documentaries films not all of them are, are scholarly by any means but if you type in hitler into a film database you get hundreds of those back so and don't get me start and there's some really amazing stuff on, on, on the internet as far as uh, uh, people make themselves. Don't, please, please, I'm not putting that down at all. But there's also a lot of of, of, of not so great stuff in a scholarly setting. Um, But again, not there's no other individual in modern history. There's more information out about, but there's more, but there's, but there's so much mystery and misinformation surrounding said individual. So let's try, let's just try to get into this. Now, Adolf Hitler believed that he was the next Frederick the Great, a hero of his as a child. He believed, he was certain that he was saving Western civilization, saving the West, not just Germany, but saving the West. And in the end, in the end, his actions will help bring about the, not the death of the West by any means, but a complete re-evaluation 
of the West. What is Western civilization? Uh, is it civilization? And it will certainly see the upcoming war will see the end of empire and the end of the old way of doing things, the end of the modern era, literally. Then we enter the postmodern era. Early years, early years. He was born in April, April 20th, 1889, in a small town in Austria, outside of Linz, Austria, right there near the Austrian, uh, the um, German Bavarian border. Remember, Austrians are ethnic Germans. They, they speak Germans, they are Germans. But he was um, living within, born within the Austro Hungarian Empire. This is a polyglot, multilingual, multi ethnic empire, which he hates. He wants to live to see the day where all ethnic Germans, German-speaking people, and ethnic both, uh, live under one nation. This is a lifelong dream. And he will be sold this as a school child uh, by his teachers as well. He'll have some German nationalist teachers that help him uh, formulate these ideas. But the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, as we've seen, is multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious. He hates it. He has nothing but disdain for it. But here, this region of Linz, Austria, right near Bavaria in the Alps, right there. He was born into a very, very lower middle class family uh not poor but certainly not rich his father was quite a bit older than his mother um 23 years older than his mother he was a very difficult man he was a civil servant he worked for the customs bureau and he expected his son to grow up and get a good government job like in the customs house of the austria hungarian empire his father was a very difficult man they fought quite a lot his mother um and he got along quite well. Um, he loved his mother, and uh, all evidence points that she loved him as well. Uh, play the game Spot Hitler. Where is this young man? He's all the way to the left. He wasn't a bad student, wasn't a good student. He was an average student. He would get into trouble for talking back to his parents as well as talking back to his father. Um, his two favorite uh, subjects in school were history and art. Um he fell in love with stories of Frederick the Great, Bismarck, uh, 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 all the old Germanic uh, heroes, Barbarossa, etc. There he is in the center. Again, not a bad student, not a good student. He had dreams of being an artist. He he had dreams of being a a, 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 a first class German artist. But often he spent his time daydreaming um, in his room when he should have been practicing painting. Time in Vienna. Time in Vienna. Well, in 1905, Hitler's father died quite unexpectedly. Um, he remained close to his mother, as I said. In 1905, he graduates school, um, having to repeat his final exam, and he decides he's going to go to Vienna to the School of Fine Arts and attend where he's going to become a painter. Now, this is the equivalent of trying to get into Harvard or Oxford. This is one of the best schools in Europe for art, and as much as he tries, he'll try twice uh, to apply, uh, being denied both times, 1907 and 1908. His art is not up to the Vienna School of Art. It's not bad. It is certainly not bad. Uh, critics will call it terrible. I, I don't think so, but it's not Vienna School of Art. It's not Vienna School of Art. His architecture is quite good. One of the professors at the school told him, why don't you go, uh, come back, apply as an architectural uh, painter? Uh, but he didn't have the uh, uh, the academic levels for that from um, what we would call high school, and so he couldn't do that. But architecturally, I think he's quite good, but not... Vienna, good. Not Vienna, good. He'll make a living, by the way. He'll be half homeless in Vienna, but he'll make a living selling these paintings to tourists, uh, to frame shops. They'll put it, they have to have some painting in the frame. Again, not bad at all. I don't think so. One of the major criticisms of the 
um, uh, admissions board at Vienna was his human drawings. They said it lacked humanity. It lacked a connection. It, it lacked a certain uh, 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 something. And that's very telling. That's very telling. Again, really good, I think, but not Vienna good. It was his time in Vienna where he gets political. Now, he can't go home. He can't admit to everyone in town that he is a failure. And so he lies. He says, yeah, I'm attending the school. And then he goes pretty much homeless on the streets of Vienna. Now, Vienna was a very multicultural, multi-ethnic, very cosmopolitan city, which Hitler hated. He hated all of these races mixing together. Um, and again, he hates the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. He longs for the day where he can live in Germany. And it's in Vienna where he becomes political. It is in Vienna where he becomes political. Vienna at this time has had an influx of Russian Jews. They are escaping the pogroms. And it is in Vienna where Hitler claims, at least, to first have become an anti-Semite, anti-Jewish. These Jews that are arriving in Vienna are coming from the Pale of Settlement. Settlement. We've seen this before. They are not like the Jews that he knew in uh, Linz. These are not like the Jews that he was used to. They had long beards. They spoke Yiddish. They wore the prayer shawl. He saw these men and women as entirely foreign. And there was a wide paranoia in Vienna at this time of foreigners in general, but especially uh, uh, Jews. There was giant waves of anti-Semitism in the late 1800s, early 1900s in Vienna. That's what uh, Theodore Herzl experienced. That's what made him a Zionist. Two men will influence him politically in Vienna while he is still a young man, semi-homeless, selling his paintings. Uh, first will be Karl Luger. Karl Luger was a populist Catholic mayor and a fierce anti-Semite, incredibly anti-Jewish. The mayor of Vienna, anytime there's a problem, it's the Jews, and Hitler will absorb this. He was very good at absorbing other people's ideas. And again, let me just say it again. Vienna is a hotbed of anti-Semitism um, in the early 1900s. The next is a George von Schoenerer. Uh, he is a politician in Vienna in the early 1900s. Um, he is a pan-Germanist. He believes that all Germans should live under one nation. Hitler is drawn to this man. He is a German nationalist. Again, there are Austrians who live in Austria that want to be part of a pan-German nation state. And he too is incredibly anti-Semitic. And he writes and delivers speeches uh, telling the Austrians of Vienna there will come a time where all Germans will live under one nation. Look at this map of 1910. There are a great many Germans living on the other side of borders. Well, um, pan-Germanism wants to see all of these Germans united under one nation state, incredibly influential to Hitler. Now, in 1914... Hitler joins the Bavarian army. He does not want to serve in the Austrian army. He was going to be drafted earlier by the Austrians, but he doesn't pass the physical test. He's too thin because he's homeless on the streets of Vienna. The war breaks out. He joins the uh, German army, and he, like so many other young men, enthusiastically go to war. And it's the war that's going to make this man. The Great War. In the war, Hitler distinguishes himself in service. He is promoted to corporal. Uh, he wins two iron crosses. One is second class. Now, that's fairly common. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, my German great-grandfather won second class. Um, but then he wins first class iron cross. Incredibly rare for a lowly corporal to win. And for the rest of his life, he's going to wear just that one medal on his lapel. That makes him... Um, in many, many circles. As much as his detractors tried to demonize his service in the army, there is a tremendous amount of evidence that shows that Hitler actually served with distinction. He, like so many, found a brotherhood in the army. It gave him purpose for the first time in his life. He had uh, uh, friends. He had a German nation behind him. Uh, here he is. By the way, he won't shave his mustache into the... The, the 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 broom 
mustache um, until the war, because they pass a rule that you have to be able to put a gas mask over your face. And so if you have a big old uh, uh, mustache, it doesn't make a seal. And so he'll later have to cut that mustache down and he'll keep that forever. Here he is on the left. He serves with distinction. And for the first time in his life, he writes this. His life had purpose. You see it's starting to narrow up a little bit. Here are some of his paintings. He will see a lot of action. He will be uh, injured quite a lot, or at least twice, um, uh, uh, seriously. He'll be in the hospital after being gassed by the British when he learns the news of Germany's surrender. Little sketches here and there. On the left is second class, Iron Cross. That comes with a ribbon. First class, I believe, uh, is with a pin. That's what distinguishes him. By the way, the officer that wrote the uh, recommendation that he should win, uh, receive the first class was a Jew. Um, ironically, because this really makes Hitler uh, politically, this opens a lot of doors to him later on. And he'll always, when all the other German officers have ribbons and medals he'll always just wear that one iron cross and he'll always just say i'm just a lonely a lowly front soldier a corporal very clever it's very 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 clever well germany asked for peace on the 14 points and does not receive peace on the 14 points we know that the treaty of versailles was forced upon the germans they are left incredibly bitter hitler is no different and it is after the war that Hitler, like so many, developed this theory, the stab in the back theory, the stab in the back theory. We didn't lose the war. No, 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 no. This, by the way, is promoted by Ludendorff. Um, no, we were betrayed by our politicians. And increasingly, increasingly, many Germans say it was the Jews. It was the Jews in government that betrayed the front soldier. Keep this in mind because Germany's looking for scapegoats and Hitler's going to give them a scapegoat. Many German Jews took offense at this. How dare you? Many tens of thousands of Jews fought in this war, died in this war. Again, my great-grandfather, a German Jew, won an Iron Cross. Um, but again, we want answers. We want a scapegoat. We need something, someone to blame. And Hitler's going to give that to the German people in due time. On top of that, in the years following the First World War, inflation hits Germany. It is ravaged economically. The mark, the German bank note, becomes utterly useless by the early 1920s. This is the mark as compared to the dollar in 1919. Look at 1923. I'm talking about taking a wheelbarrow of money to buy a loaf of bread. It becomes a joke in Germany. It becomes an absolute joke in Germany. Uh, inflation is so high that people use it as uh, uh, wallpaper, toys, building blocks, you name it. Hitler's going to take advantage of this. Although Germany will right itself uh, by the middle 1920s, um, it'll face another financial collapse with the Great Depression. Here are some kids. Who needs building blocks when you have Deutschmarks? This is the Germany that Hitler and millions of front soldiers return to. You've seen your friends' heads explode, and you come home, and this is the economy. Your kids are playing with banknotes as kites. That's how worthless your money is. Oh, by the way, you also lost your empire, 13% of your nation, and you pay, you owe billions in reparations. Entry into politics. Hitler had no formal education or career prospects, and so he tries to stay in the army as long as possible. And in the end, the army has a job for him. He is going to be an intelligence agent for the military. His job is to go and investigate all of these different groups that are emerging following the First World War. These far left-wing groups, these communist groups that the military is terrified of, 
They send Hitler in to investigate. What are they talking about? What are they doing? This is Hitler's job. It doesn't pay a lot, but it gives him something. It gives him a purpose. He investigates one of these far left wing groups. Again, remember, the fighting is continuing. It doesn't end in 1918. There's literally a civil war going on in the streets of Germany, on the streets of Berlin. Um, and so he is sent to investigate the German Workers' Party. It sounds left wing, does it not? German Workers' Party it sounds like a bunch of communists. And so they send Hitler to investigate this tiny group. It's one of hundreds. It's one of hundreds. Hitler arrives at the German Workers' Party, and he's attracted to it. He actually likes what he hears. It's not communist. It's not Marxist. It is certainly anti-Jewish, certainly anti-Semitic, but it is also anti-capitalist. It is fiercely nationalist. It is militaristic. He likes this party. It's led by Anton Drexler. Anton Drexler, and Hitler is attracted to what Anton Drexler is, is saying. Drexler favored a strong, active government around a, quote, non-Jewish version of socialism. He wanted to see all Germans united racially, but not but but we don't want to get rid of the class divisions necessarily but he he envisions this hitler's going to build on this 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 sort of socialism without class struggle or communism it's interesting well by hitler joins the party let me backtrack a little bit hitler joins the party uh they put him down as member 555 he's actually the 55th member of the german workers party but they want to make their numbers look bigger so they fudge the numbers and then later they'll change it to make him number seven as he gets older uh, uh he wants to make it look like he was there earlier and so they change it and say that he was the seventh uh, member of the German Workers' Party. He wasn't. He was the 55th. Uh, they fudged the numbers in the beginning, and then they fudge the numbers later on. By, 19, nine, by 1921, Hitler muscles out Drexler. He takes over the party. His oratory skills, his speaking skills are second to none, and it becomes very apparent very quickly if there's going to be a leader of this German Workers' Party, it's going to be Hitler. Hitler changes the name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party um, and adopts the swastika as their uh, symbol, as their insignia, as their flag. He writes in Mein Kampf, he thought that the color red does, shouldn't belong to the communists, that red pops. He literally writes it like a an art school kid. It pops in the dreary uh, post-war uh, 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 drudgery of, 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 of Weimar, Germany, and he chooses the swastika. Now, I'm sure you know this, the swastika is an ancient symbol. Now, it's forever stained uh, with Nazism, but it certainly, certainly, certainly was not uh, an original symbol. Uh, swastikas date back to ancient times. You find them in Asia, uh, North America, South America, Africa, um, children will draw swastikas it's just it's it's a clever design it's a clever design that dates back many many thousands of years there are literally cave paintings with swastikas this is a 3200 old iranian persian it's i guess even before persia was an empire ancient mediterranean swastikas this, I believe, is a Roman floor. It's, it was used forever by a multitude of cultures, sometimes facing left, sometimes facing right, sometimes in the form of a diamond, other times in the form of a square. Here are some Native American athletes with the swastika on their shirt, 1909. Hockey team, 1916. a sign of good luck in a great many circles, including the United States. Fine eating California fruit. Coca-Cola, no less. My God. My God. I like this one. This guy said, hey, you know what? Hitler be damned. 
This has been our sign since 1922. <laughs> Something tells me it didn't last. I don't know. Call me crazy. Something tells me Swastika Drug Company changed their name. Hitler, like Mussolini, and he's going to borrow a lot for Mussolini for the record, uh, will base many, much of his symbolism, regalia, on the Roman Empire. Again, as soon as the Roman Empire ends, Europeans have been trying to recreate that for going on 1,500 years. This is the German eagle as compared to the Roman eagle. You can see the similarities. I don't have to draw it out for you. What was National Socialism, this thing developed by Hitler? Well, like Italian fascism, it presents itself as a third way. It is not only anti-communist, but especially in the early years, it is anti-capitalist. Um, was it socialist? Well, yeah, in the early years, certainly. It was very much left-wing in certain respects. Um, it wanted to... Uh, nationalize certain industries, certainly. However, as Nazism or National Socialism gets more and more popular, they begin to abandon many of their more socialist, left-leaning uh, uh, tenets to attract big business. And so they begin to drop more and more of their left-wing uh, 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 beliefs. What is National Socialism on top of that, well, think of it more as racial socialism. A national socialist in the 1920s argued that we can bring society together for a common goal. And what unites us is our common bloodline. We get it kind of mixed up in the West because national means something different than racial. But to these ideologues, national and racial are the same. And so we're not going to destroy class divisions. We're not revolutionaries in that respect, but we are going to bring society together based on our ethnic, racial uh, 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 identity. That's what racial or national socialism uh, should be understood as as best as I can in a simple way. What were the National Socialists' stated goals in the early years and later years? Well, they declared that they were going to overcome social divisions with all parts of a racially homogenous society working towards national unity. We don't think of the individual. We think of the race. We think of the, 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 the nationality because the two are the same. The two are the same. It's hard for Americans to understand that, but the two are the same to these um, ideologues. Two, we want to enlarge German territory and unite all Germans across Europe into one political body. So they're expansionists. And finally, rid German culture and society of all Jewish influences. Even though they're less than 2% of the population, they are blamed for everything. And we'll get there in a moment. But that is essentially what the National Socialists uh, are promising. And we're going to tear up the Treaty of Versailles because that is abhorrent, according to the National Socialists. This movement will grow. This movement will grow. It's still a minor player. There are many of these groups, these, 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 these far-right groups out on the streets battling far-left groups. There are hundreds of those as well, but it's going to grow, certainly. The NSDP, the National Socialist German Workers' Party growth. Well, using his oratory skills, his fundraising skills, propaganda, and timing, timing like anything, it's timing has a lot to do with this, Hitler will soon begin attracting crowds of thousands in beer halls across mostly southern Germany, Bavaria. This is the the the, the epicenter of Nazism. Um, beer halls were common places for speeches. Again, they're literally beer halls. Think of it as an indoor beer garden or sometimes an outdoor build a uh, 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 beer garden. What the audiences that came to Hitler's speeches got were answers. Why did we lose the war? Why is uh, there cultural degeneracy in Germany? Why is the economy so bad? This is what Hitler gave to the um, audiences there. Um, he'll say, he'll write in Mein Kampf that his entire life, he didn't quite know what he was great at. 
until he began public speaking. He took this incredibly seriously. I'm going to show you a series of photographs uh, Hitler had taken of himself with him practicing in front of a mirror. These are going to embarrass him. He won't allow these to be published in his lifetime because it, he thought it made him look amateurish. But this is the pains he went through trying to reach an audience. And he would he wasn't always yelling. Sometimes he would speak softly when he's speaking of perhaps uh, a hungry German family. Uh, and then he would thunder when it came to reparations being uh, uh, forced upon the German people. It wasn't all just yelling. I promise you this. That's often what we just see in those old uh, newsreels. But this is his tool. This is his weapon, his public speaking. And he is going to use utilize this skill tremendously. Even people that hated him that went to go see him speak said, well, there's something there. I don't personally like it. I don't like what he's saying, but there's something there. I just think they're ridiculous, so I do I do like looking at them. But if you're going to practice, if that's your tool, then you should, certainly. This is the more casual Hitler. In these early years, please note that most of these Nazis were quite low figures. These are not the elites by any means. These are mostly veterans. These are men that have failed in many, many things that are trying to recreate the brotherhood and the glory that they experienced in the First World War. But please know that elites within society looked at these men um, as thugs, as, as ne'er-do-wells. Just please keep that in mind. He's going to clean up his act as the decade progresses, but especially in the early years. These are street fighters. These are the brown shirts, the SA, I should say. Um, these were his, the equivalent of Mussolini's black shirts. But again, he's speaking to something and he is going to start getting financing from wealthy uh, industrialists who want nothing more than to see someone else, someone else, take power other than the communists remember the communist threat the soviet union has just fallen is a giant fear there are literally battles going on in the street the beer hall push this was supposed to be his march on rome uh, remember mussolini's march on rome well this was the plan this was the plan and he enlists none other than eric ludendorff one of two of the silent dictators of the first world war ludendorff and hitler come into a conspiracy there is ludendorff on the left hindenburg on the right the other two of remember that silent dictatorship of the war the plan was this we are going to take over munich and we are going to take over bavaria the state of bavaria and then we will topple the uh, Weimar Republic that hated democracy. The army is going to rise up on our side and we will topple the government. This is the beer hall push, the beer hall revolution. This is the, this is what's going to start it. This is what's going to kick it off. Well, Hitler and about 600 machine gun armed SA or brown shirts do in fact take over a beer hall where representatives of the government were delivering a speech. They walk in with machine guns. He yells, the revolution has begun, and they go about securing this beer hall. They force those representatives of the government to swear an allegiance to them. For the record, this is a short-lived revolution. This is a very short-lived revolution. Um, the next day, the next day, they try to march on the Ministry of Defense. The army is not loyal to the Nazis or Ludendorff, and they shut it down. They open up machine gun fire. Hitler drops to his belly, although Ludendorff, all witnesses say Ludendorff didn't flinch. He just kept walking towards the machine guns. They didn't fire on him. But that's Ludendorff. That is Ludendorff. They were all arrested. They were all arrested by the military. The Beer Hall Push, long story short, is a giant failure. It is a giant failure. But this was the attempt. This was the attempt to uh, 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 
by force take over Germany. Bavaria in revolt. Bavaria in revolt. Munich revolt regime headed up by Ludendorff. Remember, Ludendorff's the celebrity here. He is the celebrity. Hitler named for chancellor as monarchists in Bavaria proclaim Reich overthrow. They weren't monarchists, but this was the article that was written. Berlin denies success of royalist rebellion. Say it has been uh, 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 quelled. Yeah, it had. It had. The coup d'etat in Munich uh, is failed. Ludendorff and the others, including Hitler, is arrested. Hitler, when they find him, is about to commit suicide. He is completely desperate. He is disheartened. It's a failure. It is a failure. Well, in the aftermath, they all go on trial. Hitler, Ludendorff, several others. Uh, Ludendorff at first is the focus, but Hitler very cleverly turns this trial upside down. First of all, the judge is sympathetic to Hitler because Hitler is anti-communist. Hitler, by the way, the entire country watches this trial. Hitler says, I am the revolution, but I'm the revolution against the revolution, meaning I am anti-communist. I'm trying to save Germany. In the end, he is found guilty. He is sentenced to five years in prison. Ludendorff is acquitted. We can't send Ludendorff to prison. He's a First World War hero. Um, he goes to Landsberg prison. Hitler goes to Landsberg prison, where he is treated very, very well uh, by the staff. He is allowed visitors. He is allowed a great many amenities, letters, etc. There is his cell. I've stayed at worse hotel rooms, quite frankly. It is at Ludendorff, not Ludendorff, pardon me, <laughs> Landsberg prison, where Hitler sets about um, formulating his next strategy, his next strategy there at uh, 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 Lindsberg prison. I don't know why they keep forgetting that he dictates a book to Hess, his right hand man, this man. Um, the book is called Mein Kampf or My Struggle. The original, the original title for his book. Let's see if you, what do you guys think about this title? It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but let me read it to you maybe maybe i can be corrected four and a half years of struggle against lies stupidity and cowardice he's told you know, maybe we should shorten it up a little bit and he does my struggle my suffering mine kampf uh ludendorff will visit him a few times in prison uh although they uh have a falling out ludendorff believed he could use hitler to come to power. But Ludendorff, like so many, didn't realize that Hitler was, in fact, uh, using Ludendorff. Um, years later, he will try to get the support of Ludendorff by offering to make him a field marshal, the highest ranking uh, a position officer within the German army. And Ludendorff said, no, God makes field marshals, not men. So they will have a falling out. They'll never be close again. Worldview. Well, in Mein Kampf, he lays out his worldview. Um, it's published in two copies, um, 1925, uh, two edition, uh, two volumes, pardon me, in 1925 and 1926. It will sell 228,000 copies between 1925 and 1932. When he comes to power in 1933, over a million copies will be sold, but many just bought it because they felt it would be better, it would look better if they had it on their bookshelf. They should have read it. They should have read it. Like so many students, they they should have read what was in it because he's very clear about his worldview and his plans for Germany. Mein Kampf is not only anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. He blames almost everything on Jews. He will be writing a chapter very clearly, and then it ends with, it's the Jews. And over, and he beats this into you. He beats this into you um, as an audience. Now, religious anti-Semitism had been in Europe for 1,500 years. However, Hitler built upon biological anti-Semitism that was developed in the 1800s. It's not their rejection of Christ that's the problem. That had been the problem in Europe for 1,500 years. They can't convert. It's in their blood. It is in their nature. This is what he writes. He also saw no distinction between 
Judaism and communism. Behind every communist threat, there is a Jew, according to Hitler. Destroy Judaism and you will destroy communism. They are one in the same. At the same time, capitalism is a product of Jews. Communism's enemy. So they get blamed both ways. World communism and world capitalism. They are behind all of those things. And he beats that in to his audience time and time again. Jews pollute culture. They bring down civilizations. They pollute blood. They bring down races of, 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 of men. And they are blamed literally for all social ills within Germany. Crime, moral decay, uh, decadent art, um, everything, everything. This is a time, by the way, this is a time, by the way, that Berlin, for example, had the highest rates of intermarriage between Gentile and Jew. And so Hitler sees this as the beginning of the end of the so-called Aryans. You see, there is a Jew behind the British Empire. American capitalism, and Soviet communism. They're blamed for everything three different ways. It is they who bring in uh, economic disaster. It is they who profit off of the hard work of the average German. This is what he beats into his audience uh, in Mein Kampf. And behind every Bolshevik movement, behind every communist movement, there are Jews, according to Hitler. Certain leaders within the communist parties of Europe were Jews, but a great many were not. But Hitler does not see. He would say, well, those are the ones that are probably secret Jews, if you want to be honest. Um, all forms of degeneracy, degenerate art, degenerate music, like jazz coming in from the United States, the Jews are blamed for that. Decadent art, decadent behavior. Remember, Weimar Germany was actually quite liberal in many respects, especially in Berlin, where 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 um, conservatives like Hitler were absolutely disgusted at all the fun and all the social, moral, uh, uh, religious boundaries that were being pushed at this time. He promises an end to all of that if he is put into power. And don't forget the stab in the back. Don't forget. The November criminals, as he would call them, Jews, according to Hitler. On race, well, certainly uh, race was a major issue for uh, Hitler. Uh, he believed that Aryan man was the most highly developed of all humans. That was not his theory by any means. None of these theories are his, but he pooled. He was a good pooler from other people, and he espoused not his own original views, but the views of others. Uh, they were the highest of all Europeans. Um, Aryans were the only true culture creators. He takes that from Chamberlain. We saw that uh, in a previous lesson. Responsible for all civilization, including Egyptian, Chinese, Indian, etc. I know. Uh, now, he believed certain cultures could maintain civilization, like, say, the Japanese. They can maintain it, but they can't create it. But Jews, again, are culture destroyers. They're not happy until they bring down a civilization and culture just like blood can be polluted so we have to guard against that so-called blood pollution this is a map of the germanic peoples of europe these are the aryans these are the highest now he recognizes that germany is far from pure but he wants to get to a place one day that maybe uh they could get there he wanted to unite all germans again under one nation state and he had nothing but contempt for East Europeans, hated East Europeans, the Slavs, these people here, the Poles, the Russians, the uh, people in the Balkan Balkans, absolute hatred of these people. Again, there was a hierarchy of whites. Slavs were, were, were just above Jews in, in Hitler's uh, estimation. Here are the Slavic people through here. Neo-Darwinism. Hitler was a tremendous believer in his form of Darwinism, that life is an eternal struggle. Um, only the most fit deserve to live and procreate. Certain men were born leaders. Certain men were born followers. He, of course, was born a leader. This is what he writes. Um, during the war, he would do things like give two men the exact same task believing that the competition between the two men would deliver much better results. Life is an eternal struggle, and those that are weak and unfit do not deserve 
to partake in this gift of life. This was his position. On religion, well, he was born a Catholic, baptized a Catholic. He never announced his Catholicism. He was never excommunicated by the church. Uh, he's a politician, and so he will use religious language when it's necessary. If he's speaking before a Catholic audience, he will use Catholic language. If he's speaking before a Protestant audience, he will use Protestant language. Again, a politician. He was most likely himself a pantheist. What is a pantheist? Well, it's a belief that God is everywhere, sort of a life force. If if you break down what, what he writes, you could most likely um, be certain or at least comfortable in calling him a pantheist. He was not a believer in the occult. You will find a tremendous amount of Hitler and occultism. Uh, a neo-pagan wanting to bring back the Germanic gods. No. A uh, Himmler, who will be the leader of the SS later, um, he is an occultist. He does believe in that. And and quite often, Hitler will, will will tell him, tone that down. It's kind of ridiculous. All right. Stop trying to stop trying to 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 preach this. It's it's making us all look bad. But Himmler um was an occultist believing in bringing back neo-pagan Germanic uh, religions, pre-Christian religions. Um, Lebensraum. Lebensraum. Hitler believed that Germany needed more living space. That's what Lebensraum means. The Japanese believe that. The Italians believe that. Both those nations come late to imperialism. So interestingly enough, they all believe that they need more living space. Hitler believed that he needed to unite all ethnic Germans of Europe and acquire land out east. The French have an empire. The British have an empire. The Germans do not have an empire. We are stuffed in this tightly uh, 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 strangled nation. And he looked east. He looked east. He believed that all that land was being wasted on the Slavs. All of that land is being wasted on these, uh, you might even say subhumans, uh, he wanted to, and he says this, I want to do to uh, this land what the Americans did to the uh, North American plains. We kick off the natives and we put Germanic families there that can actually produce the grain, the barley that we need. Lebensraum, this is a central part of national socialist belief. It's one of the reasons why he invades the Soviet Union, in search of Lebensraum. We are going to colonize this region. And if it means the death of, of, of millions of Slavs, so be it. Rise to power. Well, in December of 1924, the Bavarian Supreme Court issued Hitler a pardon, and he was released from jail. He had served little over a year in prison. Mein Kampf is published um, to mixed uh, successes. His party is in rubbles, and he has to go about rebuilding his party. At first, he is banned from public speaking, although he soon gets around it. Um, and it is following his imprisonment that Hitler decides to use what he hates most, to destroy what he hates most, democracy. We are going to use democracy to destroy democracy. The beer hall push didn't work. But we can use democracy. We can use the vote. We can get the people out there on our side. And so he goes about rebuilding his party. And it actually begins to work. He gets funding from wealthy industrialists. Remember, he is the revolution against the revolution. He is anti-communist. It's me or those guys. Membership. Over the 1920s, Nazi membership will grow. By 1929, they have 130,000 members. They come from all swaths of society. 7% belongs to the upper class. The upper class always was a bit suspicious of the uh, 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 Nazis, although there were some very high uh, 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 social uh, uh, Nazis. There were some very uh, uh, high on the uh, social hierarchy, Nazis, pardon me. Okay, 7% came from the peasantry, 35% were industrial workers, and 51% of Nazi membership in the 1920s come up what would be described as the middle class. 
also at this time, please remember, or no, I haven't said it, um, that the left wasn't united. You have moderate socialists all the way to extreme revolutionary communists. And so as the Nazis grow in membership, there continues to be a lot of infighting all among the left in Germany. From 1929 to 1933, the Weimar Republic was in crisis. It was in crisis. 1929. 1929 brings the Great Depression in the United States. No other nation was more tied, more reliant on the United States than Germany. You see, the United States steps in in the 1920s and and and, and deals with Germany, works with Germany. The Americans aren't nearly as bitter against Germany uh, for obvious reasons than the French or the British. But in 1929, when the stock market collapses in the United States, it has giant ripple effects in Germany. Um, people lose their money in banks. Bread lines return. Germany of 1929 to the early 1930s goes back into economic ruin. Millions are thrown out of work. Many banks simply collapse. But Hitler takes advantage of this through, again, democracy. Democracy. Who is going to bring law and order and restore the economy? The National Socialists. So as people fight it out in the street, the National Socialists. And so he uses democracy. And he runs party members across Germany. He, too, will run for president of Germany in a very modern campaign in many respects. All across the country, his brown shirts go out and campaign for him, intimidate for him. One of many parties, please remember that. Here are some brown shirts, some members of the SA. They're, they're insignia here. Death to lies, Marxism, high finance. Workers, the brain and the fist, vote for the front soldier Hitler. He always presented himself, I am merely a front soldier. Fight hunger and despair, vote for Hitler. Please know, too, that he is toning down his anti-Semitism during this time. He is toning it way down, and he's telling other party members, shh, Germans are very law-abiding people. They don't want to hear anger, distrust, and hatred. Tone it down. Tone it down. Women save the German family. Vote for Adolf Hitler. Remember, women have the vote in the Weimar Republic. Hitler was the first politician to use airplanes to campaign, flying from town to town to town, um, circling above the audience. He is also one of the first to utilize this new invention, the radio. He'll utilize this throughout his career, um, directly addressing the German people. Now, in the end, the Nazis do quite well. They do quite well. They receive a great number of the vote. 43.9% uh, of the vote go to the Nazis. That's not enough. That is not enough because he is running against, he is running against Hindenburg, the hero of the First World War, the second of the silent dictatorship with him, Hindenburg. Hindenburg wins, but Hindenburg has a massive problem. The German parliament is in disarray. There are so many parties that no one can get anything done. And increasingly, he is ruling by decree. Increasingly, democracy appears to be a hindrance to Germany progressing. And so Hindenburg and a number of elites decide to make a deal with the devil. What about if we bring in Hitler, who has the largest party in Germany, we bring him in, we make him chancellor, second in command, we can bring unity in parliament, pass laws, and we'll keep him in order. This is the thing about Hitler. The elites always believed we could keep him in check. Like Napoleon, when he was a member of the Triple Council, they believed they could keep him in check. This is what Hindenburg and other elites in the government believe. He's outnumbered in the cabinet. He can build a coalition of other far-right groups. We can keep him in check. And so in January of 1933, Hitler is made chancellor. Let's think, call him second in command of the German 
government. He leads a coalition, a short-lived coalition. However, the real power remains with Hindenburg. Hindenburg has nothing but contempt for the corporal, that lowly corporal. Just please know that. But we can use him to bring unity to the government. Hitler plays the dutiful second fiddle to Hindenburg. He knows Hindenburg's old. He knows it's just a matter of time. And so he's more than happy. This hopefully will bring stability to Germany. If you stay united and loyal, the Reich will never be destroyed. Okay. As long as Hindenburg's alive, Hitler can be put in check. This is the belief. This is the belief. The birth of Nazi Germany. Uh, upon taking the chancellorship uh, a mere weeks after taking the chancellorship um the government began to clamp down on opposition uh meetings of left-wing parties were banned and even some moderate parties found that their members were being threatened and assaulted the weimar flag is abandoned very quickly it is dropped this is a symbol of the Weimar Republic. Hindenburg hated it as much as Hitler did. And so the old imperial flag is brought back. The old imperial German flag is brought back. Hitler's absolute rule, his dictatorship does not happen overnight, but it begins with the Reichstag fire. In February of 1933, the House of Parliament as we can call it, the Reichstag is set ablaze. It is set ablaze. Well, who did this? Who set our beautiful House of Congress, you would call it here, ablaze? Who could it possibly be? My God. My God. Well, someone has to have done it, no? Well, we soon find who is responsible. Who in the hell did this? Well, it is an alleged communist. It's an alleged communist, a young Dutch boy who was said to have started the fire. Now, he is a communist. He certainly is a leftist. I um, mean, he'll admit to it. He'll admit to the fire. Um, he said he did it in an attempt to rally German workers across fascist rule. This young boy is... I have no other words than to call him dim-witted. He's half-blind on top of it. But he started the fire, allegedly, although many rumors were abound, that perhaps he didn't start the fire. Perhaps there were brown shirts seen in the area that night. But okay, he admits it. He's put on trial, a pitiful sight for all to see. Um, he admitted that he did it. And so he is found guilty, this young Dutchman. What is the punishment for this young man? Well, he is guillotined. He is guillotined. He is beheaded by the government. And then the government passes the Reichstag Fire Decree. This is the beginning of a dictatorship in Germany. Signed off by Hindenburg for the record. What this does is it reverses many of the civil liberties that the Germans had enjoyed under the Weimar Republic, a democracy. Number one, it gave the Nazi-led government the legal basis to imprison anyone considered to be opponents of the state without any specific charges. You're an enemy of the state. Well, what am I being charged with? You're an enemy of the state. Two, it also gave the central government the authority to overrule state and local laws and to overthrow those governments. It would be the equivalent of D.C. being able to overturn anything that California, Nevada, New York passes. Finally, it gave the government the ability to suppress publications not considered friendly. And so thousands of suspected communists and leftists are rounded up and placed in jails and camps. This is the first we see of concentration camps. These aren't death camps, but people are beginning to disappear in the night. And publications, magazines, pamphlets, newspapers are being shut down across the country. They are enemies of the state. The Enabling Act follows the Reichstag fire. Just three weeks after the passage of the Reichstag fire, 
This enabling act gave Hitler's cabinet the legal power to decree laws without being passed by the Reichstag, making Hitler essentially a dictator. Every few years, it'll be re-upped, this enabling act. He can pass laws without the House of Representatives. Uh, by 1943, it's for life. You don't have to keep voting on this. You've got it for life. Also note, by this time, Hitler is announcing an end to the, the Treaty of Versailles, and he is secretly rebuilding the military. Secretly rebuilding the military. Please keep this in mind. Dictatorship bill in Germany. Hitler on the Reichstag fire. In March of 1933, Jewish Americans and Jews in Europe lead an anti-German boycott. Because the Nazis are vehement anti-Semites, this boycott um, is called. It actually begins to have an effect, believe it or not. Um, German imports to the United States were reduced by nearly a quarter compared with the prior year. Judea declares war on Germany. We're not going to buy your stuff. We're not going to buy your stuff. Um, it occurs across parts of Europe, Britain, Palestine, and the United States. Boycott Nazi Germany. This greatly angers the German authorities, for the record. And they lead an anti-Jewish boycott April 1st, 1933. This was the German government's first officially sanctioned anti-Jewish boycott. What they called for is a one-day boycott, but if the anti-German boycott isn't lifted, this will go on forever. All across Germany, brown shirts put signs up, do not buy Jewish goods. Boycott Jewish merchants. Germans, defend yourselves. Do not buy from Jews. Now, in reality, this doesn't, most Germans don't follow this boycott, but it's a taste to come. This boycott was a failure. This boycott was a failure for the most part, but it's a taste to come. It's a, this was the first overtly anti-Jewish activity carried out by the Nazis. And it's going to continue very, very quickly after this. Jew was painted on Jewish owned businesses. The taste of what's to come. Jewish trade paralyzed by Nazi boycott. No, it does do damage for sure. But the Nazis are a little bit surprised when the Germans don't. They're not ready for this. They're not ready for this yet. They will be. They will be. The civil service law is passed shortly thereafter, uh, April 1933. It said civil servants, government workers who were not of Aryan descent, or opponents of National Socialism, were forced to retire from civil service. This meant that Jews and political opponents could not serve as teachers, professors, judges, and other government positions. Soon after, the law was widened, um, or a similar law was passed concerning lawyers, doctors, tax consultants, musicians, even notaries. Hindenburg objects. He objects to this law. And he makes some exceptions. He forces Hitler to make some exceptions. If you are a veteran of the First World War, this doesn't apply to you. Even Hindenburg was like, well, wait a minute. There were a lot of Jews that fought for this country. Um, those who lost a father or a son in combat in the Great War, they were exempted. Or people that had been in the civil service continuously since 1914, before the Weimar Republic was established, they were all exempted. But other than that, you are no longer allowed to have these government jobs or those other jobs that I listed. You're still a doctor, Liebenthal, but you are no longer working at this government establishment. In 1933, the German government also established a eugenics program. In July of 1933, the law for the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring was proclaimed. Now, physicians had to register Every case of hereditary illness known to them, except in women over 45 years of age, physicians could be fined for failing to comply. In the first year of the law's operation, nearly 4,000 were sterilized. 
This propaganda says the cost of feeding one person with hereditary disease for one day is the same as it would cost to feed an entire family of healthy Germans. Why are we wasting all this money on them when it could go to you, the German family? Propaganda after propaganda tells the German people the nice thing to do, the nice thing to do is to leave these people to nature. This is the part of the uh, neo-Darwinism that Hitler and the National Socialists espoused. By the end of the Nazi regime, uh, 400,000 people were sterilized against their will. 400,000 people were sterilized against their will. They also secretly, secretly brought in uh, these uh, vans and they tested a new gas, Cyclone B, on these mentally and physically handicapped Germans. They killed them. Between uh, 100 and 200,000 Germans were uh, euthanized, as the Germans would say. Your son or your daughter is in one of these hospitals. You come to visit. I'm, I'm here to see Anton. Oh, he passed away in the night. I'm so sorry. We were going to call you. This is what these German families were told. This is a secret uh, 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 operation, the T4 operation. Secretly, the government killed hundreds of thousands of these uh, uh, Germans. They experiment with different gases. They find that Cyclone B works the best. They're going to take this technology and apply it to other people, which we'll see in our next lesson. That's negative eugenics, right? But positive eugenics is we want more of the so-called good, better people to breed. And so uh, the Nazi government began giving out medals to mothers who have many children. Uh, the more children, healthy children you have, the higher the medal, the cross of honor of the German mother. And then Hindenburg dies. He dies of lung cancer. The one man who could reign in Hitler dies in April of 1934. This hero of the Second World War requested that no swastikas be at his funeral. It was mostly abided by. Where do you bury this hero of the First World War? Well, Tannenberg Memorial. Remember that war, that battle, pardon me, that destroyed so many Russians in the early hours of this war? He is placed there, the hero of Tannenberg, along with Ludendorff. The one man who could have reigned in, who could have reigned in Adolf Hitler is gone. There he is, buried alongside his wife. Well, at once new elections were held. New elections were held. A referendum that was is going to merge the chancellorship and the presidency into one position. It's almost like when a uh, a, a sports player retires. We, we retire his number. There can never be another number 23, right? Well, Hitler says there can never be another Hindenburg. There can never be another president. Who can replace him as president? Let's merge the chancellorship and the presidency. Well, 90%, 90% of the Germans agreed, keeping in mind that many of the political parties have been disbanded, many people have been arrested, but 90% of the Germans agree um, Hitler is now both. He is all-powerful. He is the Fuhrer, the leader of Germany. This is the official entrance of Nazi Germany into the world. But he has some cleaning up to do. He has some business to attend to. Two, which brings us to the night of the long knives. As much power as he has, there's certain distrust within the Nazi party. There's certain members that are a little bit too left leaning or have too much power, especially Ernst Rom. Um, where is he? Right here, this guy, leader of the Brown Church, leader of the SA. Hitler needs the loyalty from the army. The army do not like this man. The Prussian leadership of the German army do not trust Hitler, this lowly corporal. They also fear the brown shirts, the SA, who are bigger in number than the army. And Rom, this man, has been gloating that he is going to bring the army under his command of the SA. 
And so Hitler makes a deal with the army. If you have the army swear loyalty to me, Adolf Hitler, I will get rid of the so-called undesirable elements of my party, and I will disband the SA. I will disband the brown shirts. And that is the night of the long knives. In one night, in one night, members of the SA and other certain radicals uh, in other uh, corners of Germany were arrested, killed. Some committed suicide. Um, he cleans up. Think of, I don't know how many of you have seen The Godfather. Think of when Michael Colleone is at the baptism scene and all of the other five families are wiped out. This is the night of the long knives. Hitler crushes all opponents within the Nazi party. Any rival within the Nazi party is killed or they commit suicide. Um, up to 700, up to 700 were killed in the night of the long knives. The German army from henceforth will swear loyalty to Hitler. Um, and those members of the officer corps who were not loyal to Hitler, they are asked to retire early and they are replaced. Hitler has now a firm control over the army and he will develop uh, his other stormtroopers, the SS. The SS will replace uh, the SA in prominence within the party. When Hitler came to power, both flags flew during Hindenburg's life. You had the old imperial flag, the Reich flag, and you had the Nazi flag. Well, in 1935, Hitler says, you know what? That flag represents the past. This flag represents the future. This becomes, in 1935, the official flag, the only flag of Hitler's Germany. He becomes the sole master of Germany. He intoxicates the German people in so many ways. He is a master of crowd work, an absolute master in so many ways. Again, even his enemies had to give that to him. When people are desperate, they will throw everything they have into anything, whether it be a religion, whether it be a political ideology. If it gives their life purpose and a sense of hope, they'll do that. Usually, oftentimes, not all people. Hitler certainly does that for the Germans. Also, in a time before rock concerts, in a time before giant professional sports stadiums, these rallies are 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 next level he would fly his plane over these rallies sometimes for an hour getting the crowd more and more worked up these hitler rallies these nazi rallies have been recreated in hollywood especially uh, star wars has borrowed heavily from this intoxicating to the people in attendance he would uh, use lights like any concert. He even reportedly had pedals underneath his podium that could control the lights. And so if he's telling a sad story about, again, a hungry German family, he hits a foot pedal, the lights go down. But as he thunders up and we will get revenge, bam, the lights up again. That's, 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 that's show business. Alphonse Heck was a Hitler youth uh, leader. And he wrote this, or he says this about uh, seeing Hitler speak. He was a young man, of course. He was a member of the Hitler Youth. Uh, quote, we erupted into a frenzy of nationalistic pride that bordered on hysteria. For minutes on end, we shouted at the top of our lungs with tears streaming down our faces, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. That means hail victory. Uh, from that moment on, I belonged to Adolf Hitler, body and soul. Those are his words, but those words could have been uttered by millions of Germans at this time. Now, we only see the images of, of, of Hitler thundering up on a podium, and, but that people aren't elected doing that. Um, and so I wanted to show you some images that the Germans would have seen. Either you have to believe that the Germans were uh, psychopathic and wanted a Second World War, or they were seeing a different... Hitler than the rest of the world was seeing. Always using children, always use children as a politician. Nothing's changed. Most witnesses, by the way, uh, report he did like kids, oftentimes favoring kids over adults. 
Many people are like that. Will never have any of his own. And keep in mind, he's a politician. Always keep in mind. He was a great a lover of animals. He was a vegetarian. He would uh, uh, offer people money, friends, if they went vegetarian. Great lover of animals. If an animal was killed in a film, he would walk out. Great lover of dogs. There is his favorite dog, the Alsatian, Blondie, I believe. Nazi Germany was the first nation to ban live vivisection. That is the uh, experimenting on animals while they're alive. Here are these grateful animals thanking Goebbels. Very progressive. Uh, Nazi Germany was the first nation to attempt to regulate and legislate cigarettes. Hitler hated cigarettes. He gave up cigarettes when he was homeless in Vienna to save money for food. Why are we allowing ourselves to be polluted with this terrible, terrible, noxious fume? You want a healthy Reich, a healthy nation. He was a great admirer of Henry Ford. In fact, he kept a bust of Henry Ford on in his office. Henry Ford, by the way, was a great admirer of Hitler. Um, he loved the fact that Henry Ford delivered to the American people a cheap, affordable car, the Model T. He wanted that for the Germans, a car for the common man, the people, the Volk, a Volkswagen, a people's car, affordable, reliant. Why do only the rich get to take Sunday drives? Why do only the wealthy get to enjoy a uh, 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 living outside of the city? And so he helped. German manufacturers create the Volkswagen, yes. Meant to be an affordable car for the masses. Very, very popular. He did not start the Autobahn, but he will continue the Autobahn, putting a lot of people to work, by the way. Remember, there's a depression going on. And so this freeway system in Germany, which later be copied by the Americans, is uh, continued to be worked on under the Nazi regime. Connecting the country. The Americans will see the Autobahn, by the way, uh, in the close of the Second World War and go, we need to do that. Eisenhower will bring that idea back to the United States. A national highway system began in Germany. He also wanted to see vacation homes for the working people. This was his dream. The war starts, and so he can't implement it. But these were uh, timeshares of sorts for working Germans, poor Germans. Why do only the wealthy get to go on vacation, get to go on holiday at the sea? And so these government made holiday complexes were made for German workers. In 1936, the Olympics comes to Berlin. The Olympics comes to Berlin. Hitler wants this to showcase all that he's done, all that he's done. While the United States is still in the grips of the depression, let me show the world what national socialism can accomplish. Now, there was a question. How are Jewish and non-white athletes going to be treated? How are Jews being treated in Germany, period? The Olympic, the U.S. Olympic Committee sends Avery Brundage or Brundage to Germany to investigate. He looks around, he sees, and he writes back, look, Jews can't have certain jobs certain uh, 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 liberties, but my country club, my country club doesn't allow Jews, so I don't see a problem with that. And so it was decided that the Americans will attend the Olympics. That is true. Many uh, uh, country clubs, um, social clubs barred Jews in the 1930s and 1940s. That wasn't outrageous. Remember, again, in the American South, blacks couldn't drink from the same drinking fountain. So for an American to see these laws, it wasn't entirely foreign to them. My favorite story when it comes to, 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 to this comes from Groucho Marx. Groucho Marx was a Jewish comedian, a movie star in America. And he writes to the local country club in New York City, listen, my daughter wants to learn to swim. I want to join your country club. He gets a letter back. 
terribly sorry we don't allow Jews into this country club. He writes back, well, I'll tell you what, she's only half Jewish. What about if she only goes up to her waist in the water? <laughs> I think that's brilliant, okay? For me personally, I think that's a, a wonderful retort to a ridiculous uh, 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 position, but that's Groucho Marx. Let's get back to the Olympics. This was Hitler's uh, 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 opportunity to show what he's accomplished, and the world was watching. The world was watching, and Berlin puts on quite a show. Remember, this is a party that is very good at pageantry. This is very, very adept at putting on these giant shows, these these mass uh, movements. It was the Nazis who introduced the torch run. Running a torch from Athens, the original uh, uh, location of the Olympics so many millennia ago, running it uh, in a relay, lighting the torch, that lights a torch, that lights a torch all the way back to Berlin. This is a practice that is still continued today, started by the Nazis. It was the first uh, Olympics to be simulcast, shooting signals. This is like early, early, early primitive versions of, 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 of television. We're not there yet, but, and do they put on a show? Uh, yes, they do. They certainly do. The world was invited and the world got a taste of what National Socialism was. Here he is. Being accosted by an American fan. He had a grand time, most witnesses say. Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens um, was there for the Americans. He beat the German. He beat the German. Um, there was a massive rumor that said Hitler refused to, to, he left. He refused to meet with them. Um, most people that were in attendance said he left earlier anyways. He wasn't meeting any of these athletes. Jesse Owens, for his part, said Hitler never snubbed me. Hitler never snubbed me. Um, I'll tell you who snubbed me, and that was my own president. Jesse Owens, a hero, an American athlete, was not invited to the White House, even though the um, white American winners of the Olympics were. He never even got a telegram from Roosevelt. Why did Roosevelt snub black athletes, Mr. Progressive? Well, it's believed that he didn't want to lose Southern votes. So uh, as, as far as Jesse Owens was concerned, Hitler didn't snub me. My own president did. My own president did. Jesse Owens uh, had to make a living running, uh, racing horses uh, just to pay bills following the Olympics. The man of the year, 1938, man of the year. This man of the year, according to time, um, is going to bring another war, a continuation of the First World War. The First and the Second World War, the same war. Just think of it as a really long coffee break in the middle. But it won't just be Europe. It won't just be Europe. The world is going to war. In our next lesson, we will see how the world goes to war. Thank you all very, 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 very much until we meet again.